Earlier today, we got a massive blog talking all things Raids 3, the Tombs of a Masket. And in this video, we're going to go through everything and do a nice broken down, more summarized version so you don't have to read through this entire post. First up, this week's game update will actually go live on Thursday rather than the usual Wednesday release. And on top of that, with this week's game update, we're actually going to get our hands on the new raid rewards in the beta. Now for some details behind the raid, which if you did watch the Summer Summit live stream, you will know most of this already. But we'll go ahead and briefly run through everything to show you how these new raids are going to shake out. First up, you will be able to have groups up to 8 participants, and there will be 4 initial challenges followed by 2 final bosses to be fought in a twin boss encounter. And by twin boss encounter, basically think very similar to how grotesque guardians work. Now for a very new system we have coming with Raid 3, and that is Invocations. And these will allow fully customizable difficulty, which will also impact your loot potential. These invocations can affect health, defense, or even damage modifiers for enemies within the raid. Other invocations might impose group restrictions like reducing the amount you can heal or even prohibiting certain spells. They intend to be very creative with how these modifiers work. They've even stated the above examples I just listed are fairly simple and safe, and they just use these to provide early insight on the impact within this blog, but going forward they like to experiment with different ideas that might drastically change how this raid reacts. Now upon entering the Tombs of a Masket, you will encounter four paths. Each of these four paths will have its own series of challenges you have to overcome with a boss at the end of each path. These challenges can range from things like traps like Sepulcher S, dodging, or even defeating a new foe in an unconventional way. But once you reach the end of a path, you'll then fight a boss using a more conventional combat encounter in order to progress to the next path. But on top of that, the raid will also be altered with the death of each boss, meaning that the order you choose will drastically impact the remainder of your raid. Defeat the four paths and bosses to descend to the lower level, and you'll encounter a chamber containing the two ancient guardians of the tomb, and once you fight both of these guardians at the same time and defeat them, you will drive a masket from the tomb to claim your rewards. Now for the quest that's going to be required in order to access Raids 3, that is Beneath Cursed Sands, and it will be a sequel to the Contact quest, driving you around investigating mysterious disappearances from Minifoss, but sadly they do list right here that Minifoss will not be opening its gates just yet, something we did see in RS3. But upon completing this quest, you will have access to the raid itself. And in this post, we do have requirements and rewards. First up are the requirements, and it is completion of contact, 62 agility, 55 fire making, and 55 smithing. And for rewards, one quest point, access to the tombs of a masket, the ability to upgrade the Karis to the Karis Partisan, and 15k agility XP. Now moving on to the more important stuff, we have the rewards. And as always, these are not all set in stone, and they are gladly welcoming any and all feedback prior to the Raids 3 poll that will be coming in the next few months. First up is the Masori equipment, and this is the new low-life range armor that will consist of a chest piece, legs, and amulet. The equipment will require 80 range and 20 defense in order to equip. And whenever you remain below 40% of your maximum health, your low life status effect will kick in, giving you additional offensive bonuses. At full health, the attack of the chest plate will be at 30, but as you can see, the low life highlighted in green, when you're below 40% of your health, it will be bumped up all the way to 40, and your rank strength will also be bumped an additional 4, compared to 0 prior to the low life effect. And they also show the added on bonuses down throughout the rest of the equipment, 18 to 25 for the chain skirt, 0 to 2 for the strength bonus, and a massive bump of 7 across the board for the brand new amulet, which actually has equivalent stats to the fury in terms of attack bonuses even prior to the low life effect, and with the low life effect has a massive bonus in comparison to the fury. And on top of that, I completely forgot to mention, the amulet actually has an additional passive effect, and that is when equipped and not influenced by the low life effect, meaning you're already below 40%, you'll take damage equivalent to 15% of your current health at a rate of every 3 game ticks. Therefore, not only will it give you added benefits when you're using the low life effect, but it will also help damage you down below it. Now moving on to the brand new wand and magic shield rewards. 
I'm actually not going to use their specific names because I don't know how to pronounce them, but the Hekka is the wand and the ward is the shield. First up for the wand, it will require 84 magic in order to equip. It has a built-in spell with charges that will need to be replenished using one soul rune and three chaos runes per charge. Normally this wand has an attack rate of two ticks and then every fourth hit it will fire a stronger attack which deals significantly more damage but will come with a longer delay after the attack. And in order to counteract the speed of the wand, they actually changed it so that the standard faster attacks will only benefit from 50% of your magic strength, and then the slower fourth attack will hit much stronger, benefiting from 150% of your magic strength bonus. Now moving on to the ward. The ward will be dropped in a broken variant, and a player with 90 prayer and 90 smithing will be able to combine the broken ward with an arcane sigil alongside 10,000 soul runes in order to repair it. And players without those stats will be able to pay Abbot Langley a $20 million gold fee to create it for them. And in order to equip the ward, you will need 80 magic, 80 defense, and 80 prayer. The broken variant will be tradable, whilst the fixed ward will be untradable. You will receive both the ward and sigil back when you dismantle it, but the runes will be lost. And the current proposed stats for the ward are 25 mage attack bonus with 53 stab defensive, 55 slash, 73 crush, 2 mage, 52 range, a 4 prayer bonus, and a 5% magic damage increase. Next up for the rewards, we have the light bearer. And this is a ring with no attack, defensive, or other bonuses, but it does however have a very unique effect. And that is, when equipped, your special attack energy will regenerate 100% faster. Unequipping the ring will cause it to reset, but your special attack energy will regenerate at approximately 15 seconds per 10%. Meaning it would take 2.5 minutes to regenerate all the way from 0 to full special attack energy. Next up, we have the new stab melee weapon, and this boasts an accuracy comparable to the Elder Maul, with an attack speed of 5 Equipping it will require 82 attack, and they expect its damage per second output to be comparable to the rapier for opponents with low defense, and then much greater damage per second against opponents with higher defense. But on top of that, they'd like to introduce a new unique mechanic with the Kapesh. For traditional weapons, they will roll between a 0 to their max hit, but for the Kapesh, they wanted to roll this formula right here. But they say all that to say that if the Kapesh's max hit is 60, then no matter what, your attack would roll between a 9 and 51, meaning you no longer can hit zeros. You're guaranteed at least a 9 with the max hit potential of 51. And the Kapesh's stats will run similar to the Elder Maul, but rather 150 with a stab attack bonus and 115 melee strength. Now for the final reward we're going to touch on in this video, and that is the Charis Partisan. And it will require 80 attack to equip, and they'd like to try something different with this weapon. And the Partisan will actually have a socket in which players can insert special jewels. And these jewels are obtained as rare rewards from the Tombs of a Masket. And depending on which jewel you put in the weapon, it will have a different effect. You can only use one jewel at a time, and these jewels will not be tradable. They have not yet decided on how they'd like to reward the players with the jewels. They could be unlocked as a random drop, or given upon a certain number of raid completions, or as a reward for killing bosses using specific methods. They're also considering whether they should be permanent one-time unlocks or whether they should have charges. Naturally, this would affect the rarity of the drop, but they'd love to hear our thoughts on how they should be implemented. The stats they have for the Partisan are 58 Stab, 58 Slash, 57 Crush, a 45 Melee Strength, and an Attack Rate of 4. And they've also given us a few of the jewel buffs they're considering. The first is the Eye of the Corruptor, and this adds a damage over time effect to attacked enemies. You won't be able to stack this effect multiple times into a single NPC, but you will be able to apply it to multiple NPCs at one time. Essentially, what I'm taking from this is it is kind of like a bleed effect. The next effect is the Jewel of the Sun, and this applies a debuff to attacked NPCs, which causes them to take higher damage for a sustained period of time. And the next one is actually incredibly interesting, and it is the Breach of Scarab. In addition to the effects that only apply within the tomb, they're also considering how jewels could provide benefits throughout the entirety of Gilinor. And this Breach of Scarab 1 would add a 33% accuracy buff to Calphite Scarabs and Beetles. 
And if you are interested, there is also some concept art within this blog. You can go ahead and check out all the way down here at the bottom. Click here to see the sketches and go through some potential things we could be seeing in Raids 3, the Tombs of a Masket. But as always, these are just concept art and may not be representative of anything we see in the final appearance of the tombs. But with that, that is everything listed within this blog. I hope you guys found this video helpful, talking a little bit in detail about some of the rewards that are going to be coming. I feel like this video might have fell a little longer than I was anticipating, but hopefully it still saved you time of having to read through the entire thing by yourself. If you guys did enjoy the video, consider dropping a like. It massively helps me out. And if you're not already, hit that subscribe button so you're notified every time I upload a new video.